With special periods of celebration, such as the celebration of 27 years of service of the executive director of the National Council on Family Relations, it's appropriate to remember glimpses of the past lives of persons who have played significant roles in our personal as well as professional lives. Her name was Ruth Hathaway then. This photograph was taken on her third birthday. Today, we honor Ruth Hathaway Jusen by remembering many NCFR leaders who have been a part of both her professional and personal life. In the beginning, in 1938, Paul Sayer, professor of law at Iowa State University, got in touch with Ernest Burgess of the University of Chicago. Together, they launched the National Conference on Family Relations, with Sayer as NCFR's first president. It was the year that Orson Welles produced War of the Worlds, that vitamin E was discovered, that the ballpoint pen was invented, and the 40-hour work week was established in the United States. In 1938, the first Constitution stated that the purpose of the National Conference on Family Relations was, quote, to advance the cultural values that are now principally secured through family relations for the advantage of the individual and the strength of the nation. Early leaders hoped that NCFR's affiliated councils, with the support of the National Conference, would carry on the work of NCFR between annual meetings. To achieve its purposes, NCFR selected annual meetings to present research on marriage and the family, to discuss problems bearing on family welfare, and to consider action programs. Criteria for membership included a $2 membership fee and a professional interest in marriage and the family. NCFR became an organization that was interdisciplinary and interprofessional, composed of members from a variety of backgrounds, including sociologists, home economists, lawyers, psychologists, physicians, clergy, and educators. During Sayre's presidency, a journal entitled Living was established. The first issue contained 32 pages and included a story for children entitled Three Horses. Adolf Meyer, a distinguished psychiatrist and neurologist from Switzerland, became our second president. In addition to serving as a president of NCFR, he served as president of the American Psychiatric Association and president of the American Neurological Association. Ernest Groves, our third president, taught the first credit course in the United States entitled Preparation for Family Living at Boston University, where he served as head of the Department of Sociology from 1920 through 1927. From 1927 until his death in 1946, he served as professor of sociology at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. He was the author of the first college textbook on marriage and the family, a book entitled Social Problems of the Family. In 1934, he established the Conference on the Conservation of Marriage and the Family, now known as the Groves Conference, for those who were teaching marriage courses. With the bombing of Pearl Harbor in 1941, the activities of the National Conference were somewhat curtailed. Ernest Burgess, professor of sociology at the University of Chicago, assumed the presidency, an office which he held until 1944. Under the editorship of Ernest Burgess, the name of the journal was changed from Living to Marriage and Family Living. The autumn 1941 issue carried the journal's first paid advertisement. Evelyn Millis Duval, a well-known author and lecturer, volunteered her time as executive secretary for the organization. This photograph was taken on January 1, 1917, when Dr. Duval was 10. She is shown here with her younger sister. And here she is as a young woman who became one of the nation's most beloved family life educators. By 1941, 14 of NCFR's affiliated councils had held conferences. From 1944 to 1946, Sidney Goldstein, associate rabbi and director of social service at the Stephen Weiss Free Synagogue in New York, and professor of social service at the Hebrew Union College in New York, served as our fifth president. Under his presidency, for the first time, students were encouraged to become members of NCFR. Until 1945, NCFR had carried on its activities through the volunteer efforts of its officers and committees. It was in that year that Evelyn Duval was formally elected as our executive secretary. Finances to pay her salary were not always available. 
and it was necessary in 1945 to raise membership dues to $2.50. Membership had dropped to 592. By 1945, 19 regional and state conferences were affiliated with NCFR. Lawrence K. Frank, one of the leading parent educators in the nation. During his term as president from 1946 to 1948, the National Conference on Family Relations became the National Council on Family Relations. In 1946, the membership increased to over 1,800. Our executive secretary was paid $1 per year. The proceedings of the annual meeting were increased from a one-day meeting in 1938 to four days in 1948. That NCFR has long been interested in political events affecting families is evident in NCFR's 1946 Committee on the Economic Basis of the Family that recommended approval of a resolution supporting continued price control, enactment of the minimum wage, passage of the Patman Bill for easing the housing shortage, and endorsement of the National Health Bill. Ernest G. Osborne was president from 1948 to 1950. A family life educator from Teachers College, Columbia University, Lank Osborne was a beloved leader whose syndicated column, Family Scrapbook, was widely read. Later, in 1964, an award for outstanding teaching was established and has been awarded annually since 1966. The year that Osborne became president of NCFR, the annual meeting was held at the Sheraton Hotel in Chicago. Single rooms were four dollars and fifty cents, and registration for the meeting was one dollar. By 1950, the organization's income increased to over twenty-one thousand dollars. Very close behind, however, were its expenditures. Membership had risen to twenty-four hundred. By 1950, marriage and family living had increased to 164 pages per issue. After 10 years as editor, Burgess's editorship drew to a close. Dr. Nadina Kevinoki, a gynecologist, became president in 1950. That was the year that the population in the U.S. almost reached 151 million, and Senator Joseph McCarthy advised President Truman that the State Department was riddled with communist and communist sympathizers. The Burgess Award was established to honor researchers who had demonstrated outstanding achievement in their field and Gladys Groves became the third editor of the journal and the editorial office was moved from the University of Chicago to Chapel Hill. In 1951, the Reverend Monsignor John O'Grady became president. 1951 was the first year that color TV was introduced in the United States. It was also the year that Marriage and Family Living published 192 pages for the year. And it was in that year that Evelyn Duval submitted her resignation as executive secretary of NCFR. Her position was assumed by Helen Hiltner, who held it until 1953. Robert Foster, director of the Marriage Counseling Service and Training Program at the Manager Foundation, became NCFR's 10th president in 1952. That was the year that Truman announced H-bomb tests in the Pacific. Eisenhower was elected president of the United States and the contraceptive pill was produced. At NCFR, the board voted to rotate annual meetings so that it would be possible to meet some years with the American Sociological Association, the American Psychological Association, and the American Home Economics Association, with the hope that we could attract more people to membership. Those were difficult times financially, for there was a $5,000 deficit in the NCFR budget. Dorothy Dyer, who was later to become the Dean of the College of Family Life at Utah State University, served as NCFR president in 1953. During Dyer's presidency, marriage and family living grew to 384 pages, and the Constitution was revised. Gladys Groves became president in 1954. The wife of Ernest Groves, she took over the Groves Conference following her husband's death and became editor of the journal. During her presidency, Armand Willis became executive secretary of NCFR, a position which he held for less than a year. A search began for a replacement that did not end until 1956. In 1954, the editorship of Marriage and Family Living was assumed by Meyer Nimkoff of Florida State University. Under Nimkoff's editorship, the journal gained increasing influence in the field. Judson Landis, 
president in 1955, was professor of family sociology and was a part of the Institute of Human Development at the University of California at Berkeley. With his wife, Mary, he co-authored Building a Successful Marriage, which sold over three quarters of a million copies. In 1955, NCFR was moved from the University of Chicago for several reasons. Foremost among these considerations was the rent and utility free space available. On September 15, 1955, an announcement appeared in the newsletter. Quote, the invitation was accepted to locate at the University of Minnesota for a period of three years, with the possibility of renewing the arrangement at the end of that time. Our new office is located just off the university campus in offices owned by a church. The church facilities were not, however, the property of the University of Minnesota. Neither were they rent nor utility free, end quote. We have remained in this church for 26 years. In 1955, the board of directors voted to establish a newsletter. Judson Landis prepared the first three issues of volume one. The treasurer's report revealed a precarious financial situation Council officers accepted a generous donation and a sizable loan from Judson and Mary Landis. He became president in 1956. The truck seen here was loaded with groceries and canned goods. He bought them for cash, permitted by mail, from Sears Roebuck in Chicago. Postage didn't cost much then. He used to cross the desert in the west in this vehicle and would sleep in the back rather than on the ground to keep away from rattlesnakes, scorpions, and tarantulas. David Treat became our 14th president. A much beloved pioneer in family life education, David is now in his 80s and is retired in Twin Bridges, California. The most important single event to occur in 1956, however, was the appointment of Ruth Jusen as executive secretary of NCFR. The lives of Ruth and her husband Vance have been intertwined with NCFR activities for over a quarter of a century. I began to work with the NCFR first on a half-time basis when Dwight, the youngest of our four children, was in kindergarten. Most of my friends were not working outside their homes, and I didn't fit their definitions of what constituted a good wife and mother. When I asked Dwight how he felt about an employed mother, he said that he loved to be at home alone for a while each day. He could sing at the top of his voice, and no one would hear him. Everyone at school en envied him because he was the only kid who, as a treat, had lunch at Kemeny's Pharmacy on Fridays. Besides, he went on, he didn't want a mother who every week moved all of the living room furniture to the dining room and all of the dining room furniture to the living room to clean house. So Dwight kept on singing, and the NCFR has been a valued and loved part of my life since 1956. In 1957, Mildred Morgan became president. I'm living in a retirement home, and my husband has been gone for four years. I am, um, we had a very wonderful relationship, and I'm sort of an outgoing person. I, uh, I like to talk with people. I like to be intimate with people. I like to work with people. But do you know, uh, some of those women, there are about, how many of them have husbands yet? Quite a lot. <laughs> Even though they're all, I think that the average age is 78 or something like that. But anyhow, I do have the feeling that as you grow older, you should not try to possess your mate, but to share them with other people. I think it would make life richer for everybody. Dr. Morgan served as professor of home and family life at Florida State University and was instrumental in the development of the interdivisional program in marriage and family living at the university. It was during her presidency in the February 1958 issue of Marriage and Family Living that Teachers Exchange appeared, a section designed for family life educators. 1957 was the year that Russia launched Sputnik 1 and 2 and at NCFR, the Constitution was revised again, and marriage and family living had a new editor, Harold Christensen. University of Texas professor Henry Bowman served as our 16th president. His text, Marriage for Moderns, was read by hundreds of thousands of undergraduate students. 1958, that was the year that Alaska became the 59th state, and that stereophonic recordings came into use. 
Some 260 persons gathered in Eugene, Oregon for the 20th annual meeting of NCFR. One of the highlights of the meeting was a provocative panel on are educators afraid of sex? The panel concluded that educators probably are. Here is our 17th president at six months of age. For many years, he was head of the counseling and psychotherapy program at the Merrill Palmer Institute. He also served as president of the American Association of Marriage and Family Counselors. Today, Aaron Rutledge is the director of the Division of Behavioral Sciences in the Department of Family Medicine at Wayne State University and is director of Gross Point Psychological Center. During his presidency, membership in NCFR rose to 2,600. One of the world's eminent family scholars is shown here on the front row right, standing with members of his family. What student or professional in the area of the family doesn't know of this man's handbook of marriage and the family? Harold T. Christensen, a Fulbright scholar whose cross-cultural research is known throughout the world, served as NCFR's 18th president. 1960 was the year that John Kennedy was elected president of the United States. During Christensen's presidency, NCFR began a major reorganization of its sections, and Ivan Nye, one of the nation's leading family scholars, became the sixth editor of the journal. NCFR's total income was approximately $30,000. Physical intimacy is the simplest and the primary and the lowest form of intimacy, and, uh, and sexual intimacy is an even lower form, I think. Uh, um, what do you mean by low? Well, I... I <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I'm reminded of something that I read the other day, which, uh, which said that, that sexual intimacy without interpersonal intimacy is like a diploma without an education. And uh, I thought that was rather well put. But I thought we were talking about ourselves. <laughs> well, I, I, yes, I will... Uh, yes, I will accept that. Um, <laughs> David Mace, a native of Scotland, became NCFR's president in 1961. A prolific writer and world traveler, Dr. Mace has said that he probably never would have thought of coming to the United States had it not been for NCFR member David Fulcomer, whom he had met in London during World War II and who set up a program for him which made the trip possible. He and his wife, Vera, moved to the United States in 1949, and we have been richer for their many contributions. I was three in 1926 when this four generations picture was taken in Wadena, Minnesota, where my father edited and published the flagship of his weekly newspaper chain, the Wadena Pioneer Journal. My mother had been born nearby in Long Prairie in 1896, met my father at the University of Minnesota. Her mother grew up in Iowa, born 1869, farmed there and in Minnesota before she and my grandfather retired to a fruit ranch in Texas. Her father was born in Ohio in 1836. He practiced law in Iowa, having migrated west to keep up with his clients. He finished his career sitting on the Iowa State Supreme Court. Wallace C. Fulton, distinguished business leader in the Equitable Life Assurance Society of New York. During his NCFR presidency, a committee was appointed to examine the goals and procedures for the Burgess Award. New guidelines provided that the award should be given biennially in recognition for continuous and meritorious research contributing to the family field. This cowboy grew up in the West and received a Grant Foundation Fellowship to complete a Ph.D. at Cornell University. He is a family life educator who has provided leadership in the development of the journal, Family Perspective. His son, Roger, is on President Reagan's staff at the White House. Blaine Porter became NCFR's president in 1963. For many years, he served as a departmental chairman at Brigham Young University and as a widely known lecturer throughout the world. His distinguished teaching and leadership led Brigham Young University to honor him recently with the designation University Professor, the first person in BYU's history ever to be so honored. At one point, uh, Dr. McCubbin reminded us that we had traveled this road uh, uh, 
uh, in a smaller group in the theory construction uh, workshop in which uh, the systems approach and its relevance for handling a number of the feedback uh, mechanisms that are at work here as you interrelate a uh, stressor being mediated by a coping strategy that uh, does not minimize but increases the, uh, uh, the uh, stress of the particular uh, condition. That sort of circular reasoning that, uh, that system theory permits you to, de to deal with does require longitudinal uh, research to disentangle and move through uh, uh, points uh, over time. Reuben Hill, one of the nation's most distinguished theorists and researchers, received the Burgess Award in 1963. In 1957, he joined the faculty at the University of Minnesota. For 12 years, until 1969, he directed the Minnesota Family Study Center. In 1973, he was named Regents Professor of Family Sociology. I have had a PhD in sociology for 22 years, and I have yet to be asked, Clark, do you really believe in sociology? <laughs> I wish someone would ask me. The answer is no. <laughs> Clark Vincent became NCFR's president in 1964. During his presidency, a Committee on Standards and Family Life Education was appointed. Marriage and Family Living became the Journal of Marriage and the Family. Editor Marvin Sussman began an international section, articles in brief, and had authors write abstracts published at the beginning of their articles. This boy, with a wonderful grin, later became a distinguished editor of the Journal of Marriage and the Family. F. Ivan Nye became president in 1965. A brilliant administrator, Nye was a strong supporter of NCFR's publications. 1965 was the year that legislation authorizing Medicare was passed, and it was the year in which Winston Churchill and Nat King Cole died. An open book and a puzzled look at the age of two. Were these portents of problems to come, like 10 years of 4-H club records, or becoming involved with Merrill Palmer, or learning to read and speak Dutch, or serving NCFR as president in 67. Hardly that. Bruce Jusen smoothed out all the rough spots. Or was there a 55-year warning about being the first editor of the family coordinator in 68-69? There is an editorial posture in the picture, predicting writing and rewriting, phrasing rejection slips, typing night and day. How could one see the world ahead from then, so full, so blessed with family, love, and friends? William M. Smith, Jr., who became president in 1966, for many years was a member of the faculty at the Pennsylvania State University. During Bill Smith's presidency, the first recipient of the Osborne Award was named. A family life specialist in the Cooperative Extension Service before her retirement, she is a grandmother of 12. Roberta Fraser Anderson is retired and today serves on a commission on aging in Portland, Oregon. The son of a mother who served as an army nurse and a father who served in the Marines during World War I, he became NCFR's president in 1967 author of a text that was first published in 1960 and is currently in its fifth edition, William Kenkel, chairman of the Department of Sociology at the University of Kentucky. In 1967, Henry A. Bowman was the second person to receive the Osborne Award for Outstanding Achievement in Teaching. And Harold Christensen received the Burgess Award. Elizabeth Force, a noted family life educator, became president in 1968. Liz is one of the pioneers in family life education at the secondary level, having taught one of the early courses in Toms River, New Jersey. Although retired, today at 81, she is active in the field, serving on state, 
national, and international boards. In 1968, the board of directors concluded an agreement with the E.C. Brown Trust Fund Foundation. This led to NCFR's assumption of the responsibility for publishing a journal called The Family Life Coordinator. Renamed the Family Coordinator, Journal of Education, Counseling, and Services, the first editor was William M. Smith, Jr. of the Pennsylvania State University. James Walters was named as the third recipient of the Osborne Award. I, I think that as we draw to a close that uh, this demonstrates my wisdom in not feeling that, you, that a panel like this and resource persons such as these needed a keynote uh, address. So I congratulate myself on uh, my decision. I think, <laughs> my friend. Richard Hay, who fortunately outgrew his bow legs of childhood, is a professor in the Family Social Sciences Department at the University of Minnesota. In addition to becoming president, Dick Hay received an Osborne Award. Sylvia Sachs received an Osborne Award as well. In 1969, NCFR dues were $20 a year. There were nearly 4,300 members, and the annual meeting was held at the Sheraton Park Hotel in Washington, D.C. One of my favorite achievements, this young man reported when he became an adult, came in 1956 when, as a member of the executive committee, I helped hire a young person to become the organization's administrative secretary. That person was Ruth Jusen. Of that original group, only Ruth and I are still active in NCFR. Our 28th president, prolific text writer, Gerald R. Leslie, professor of sociology at the University of Florida. The Family Coordinator was published under the editorship of William C. Nichols, a position he held through 1975. An Osborne Award winner in 1970, this soldier was to grow up and become a leading family life educator. A gentle person, he was much loved by his colleagues in NCFR. And here is a picture of the late Don Carter as a young man. For many years, Don served as a professor in the Department of Family and Child Development at Utah State University. Those of us who knew Don will remember him with great professional esteem and affection. Also a recipient of the Osborne Award in 1970 was this young man who did one of the early television series on family life when TV was in its infancy. J. Joel Moss of Brigham Young University, a splendid administrator and family life educator, Joel has been an NCFR member for many years. 1970 was the first year that the Outstanding Student Award was given. There were two recipients. Here we find Elam Nunnally, who is now an associate professor in the School of Social Welfare, University of Wisconsin at Milwaukee. The other recipient of the Outstanding Student Award that year was Sherrod Miller, who is president of the Interpersonal Communications Program of Minneapolis. And Carl Fred Broderick, a professor at the University of Southern California, served as editor of the Journal of Marriage and the Family. I'm not sure that these are the highlights of NCFR history, but do you remember when Bob Blood brought an armload of copies of his new textbook for display at an annual NCFR meeting, and they all disappeared as free samples? Or when Harold Christensen and Ivan Nye made serious speeches about whether or not NCFR should take, on, take a stand on policy issues? Or when Jerry Newbeck first started his now-renowned interviews? When Wally Fulton brought a lot of sense and a little nonsense to the presidency? When Crawford B. was a tall, lanky, silent assistant professor? When we had that rip roar and annual meeting at Estes Park, when we revised the Constitution that Bill Nichols kept right on revising, and most of all, when Dorothy Dyer found Ruth Jusen to take on a job that was to last for 30 years. Do you remember? I do. Eleanor Lucky became president in 1971. During Lucky's presidency, there were two Osborne Award winners. The first was Richard Kirchhoff, who today is a professor at Purdue University. The second Osborne Award winner for 1971 was Rose Somerville, 
professor emerita and lecturer in sociology at san diego state college seen here at three different stages of her life i am impressed with some progress that i see uh, i have some figures let me just give them to you it takes only a moment i've seen some figures recently on this last academic year's enrollment of women in medical colleges. 18% of the students now are women. This almost doubles the less than 10% who were in medical colleges in 1970, 1971. In law school, the proportion also has doubled. Women now constitute 19% of the law school enrollment instead of the earlier 8.5 percent. One of the most important happenings at NCFR occurred under the leadership of Reuben Hill and Ivan Nye. A group formed the Theory Development Workshop, which was independent of the research and theory section. In 1971, there were two recipients of the Outstanding Students and Young Professionals named. Here we have Dean Black who today is president of the Sunrider Corporation in Orem, Utah, and Marie Osmond, who today is an associate professor of sociology at Florida State University. Gut level communication, leveling, letting it all hang out, may actually be only modern psychological versions of the old medical practice of bloodletting. Uh, harmless, but useless in some cases, and injurious and even fatal in uh, other cases. Murray Strauss of the University of New Hampshire became president in 1972. During his presidency, there were two Osborne Award winners. One was Stella Goldberg of the Pennsylvania State University, and the other was James Gladden, who for many years was on the faculty of the University of Kentucky. Here we see a picture of Jim, who is retired and makes his home in Lexington. Jim and his wife have 19 grandchildren. In 1972, NCFR honored three outstanding students and young professionals. We have kept track of two of them. Here we see Rudy Ray Seward, who today is a member of the faculty of the Department of Sociology and Anthropology at North Texas State University and Graham Spanier, who today is Vice President of Undergraduate Studies at the State University of New York at Stony Brook. The Burgess Award winner of 1972 was the noted author Jesse Bernard. But it's real. Men don't want women around, except under their term. Don't call us, we'll call you. So uh, when they do let women in, you know, they can be very cavalier. But otherwise, stay out. And they, they have all kinds of techniques for making this very, very clear. Well, I won't go into that. I have the data, I have the evidence. A second great characteristic of this male world is it is anti-female. Men do not like women. We are a young discipline. An unproven neophyte with an unknown status among the other disciplines concerned with human problems. This basic fact often makes it difficult to attract the most or more competent student one who seems to show promise in the area of inquiry. Indeed, we should be seeking students who tend to be independent, those willing to suffer the sting of criticism for traveling unmarked paths and byways, and willing to work lonely hours to fulfill the promise of the study of the family. We often see a gifted student attracted to sociology, psychology, education, or home economics because these departments and disciplines at least offer a secure status in the hierarchy of statuses in the social sciences. The grandson of a seaman in the Swedish Navy, the son of a grocery store owner, our 31st president, Leland J. Axelson, began his career as a high school teacher. Today, he is a professor in the Department of Family and Child Development at Virginia Tech. 1973 was the year that NCFR entered negotiations with Sage Publications to revive NCFR's monograph series, a series designed to make available manuscripts too long for publication in our journals. In 1973, there were two Osborne Award winners for excellence in teaching. One was Edward Pope, who until his retirement was with the Cooperative Extension Service in Washington, D.C. And the second winner was this person, who looks today very much as she did as a child. Rebecca Smith, 
professor in the Department of Child Development and Family Relations at the University of North Carolina in Greensboro. Paul Glick, senior demographer in the U.S. Bureau of the Census, received the Burgess Award. In 1973, Charles Cole was named Outstanding Student of the Year. Here he is shown with his wife, Anna, who is an active NCFR member and a marriage and family therapist. Today, Chuck is an associate professor of family environment at Iowa State University and is director of their family therapy training program. Now, for reasons that are probably too difficult for most of us here who are not uh, psychotherapists to understand, I tend to take the slights of middle age personally. I've become a propagandist for the middle aged with help I think that we could wipe out such phrases or expressions as, quote, some of my best friends are middle-aged, or, quote, middle-aged men are all right in their place, but I wouldn't want my daughter to marry one. <laughs> Lately, I've been urging people, especially young women, take a middle-aged man to lunch. <laughs> Richard Kirkhoff became president in 1974. Under his presidency, our annual income rose to $285,000, and we had nearly 5,500 members. JMF received 271 manuscripts, but two-thirds of them were rejected for publication. This child, who looked then much as she does today, was the recipient of the Osborne Award as the Outstanding Teacher of the Year. Mary Hicks, professor of home and family life at the Florida State University, and the person responsible for developing this year's annual meeting program. The first Distinguished Service to Families Award of the National Council on Family Relations was given to Ruth Jusen in 1974. This award, to be given annually, is presented in recognition of exceptional volunteer and professional efforts and outstanding leadership in the cause of better family living. The recipient of the Student of the Year Award went to Douglas Sprinkle, who, today, is the Director of Training and Research in the Purdue Marital and Family Therapy Program. I remember one time when my sister worked in the junior high school, you know, in the office, the only advantage in doing that was you got to look up everybody's records. And uh, that's how I found out what my IQ was. It was a little disappointing, actually. I thought it was higher than it was. Uh, it's been a humbling experience to remember what it was, actually. Uh, the, so the most of this is blah. But um, one of the things she found was a little note that one of the school counselors had made in my file. And uh, my mother had come into school, I hope not for anything I did bad, but uh, the school counselor had said, uh, Mrs. Astley, which is her name now, has been married three times, but she seems like a nice lady. <laughs> <coughs> and uh, and uh, she is a nice lady, and she got better at it as she went along. And so... Uh, Carl Fred Broderick, professor of sociology at the University of Southern California, became president in 1975. Broderick's efforts in NCFR will be best remembered for his support of the development of the journals. During his presidency, under the editorship of Yetzi Spray, the first volume of the new monograph series was published, Richard Gelly's The Violent Home. This Osborne Award recipient is from Purdue University. A clockmaker, he invites you to drop in at the top of the hour for a concert led by a grandfather clock and numerous noisy grandchildren clocks. And here he is shown with his elementary school class in 1939. He is sitting in the second row on the right, holding a cat. Wallace Denton, Director of Family Therapy in the Department of Family Studies and Child Development at Purdue. 1975's Burgess Award winner is shown here at 18 months, dressed in white with his hands folded. He was an early collaborator with Ernest Burgess at the University of Chicago. A prolific researcher and writer, his work on mental retardation and its impact on families is known throughout the world. Here he is shown with an X drawn on his trousers at age four. Bernard Farber, professor of sociology at Arizona State University shown here with his beautiful wife. In 1975, the Distinguished Service to Families Award was presented to David and Vera Mace, whose work on behalf of families throughout the world is well known. And then he went on to say, quite surprising question, because he didn't know 
us and we didn't know him and he said how long have you been married obviously in his mind linking the fact that we looked happy and uh, that he attributed this to the fact that perhaps we might be on our honeymoon <laughs> So whereupon David said, 41 years, and he nearly fell over. I wish I could tell you how he looked and how he crumpled up. He said, with the same woman, 41 years. Well, he said, I'd be, I'm with my third wife now, and, and I, I, I can't stay with a woman longer than two years. And we thought, well, how relevant this was. We should have invited him to come here, shouldn't uh -huh. we? <laughs> but and obviously, he didn't begin to know anything about intimacy. No, we may see him again and have some words in his ear. And in 1975, Pauline Boss was named the Outstanding Student of the Year. Today, she's an Associate Professor in Family Social Sciences at the University of Minnesota. There are many ways to approach this topic, and I decided to approach it from a non-personal way, because when I started thinking about if I would talk about marriage in advice terms, what would I say to you? And it all boiled down to select well and work like hell. But that didn't seem very presidential. William C. Nichols, Jr. became our 34th president in 1976. The Osborne Award recipient for that year was John Hudson, professor in the Department of Sociology at Arizona State University. And the 1976 recipient of the Burgess Award was Ivan Nye. In 1976, NCFR undertook the publication of a new journal, the Journal of Family History, under the editorship of Dr. Tamara Haraven of Clark University. I'm very pleased and feel very honored to be here as an historian, especially I'm very grateful for the uh, fine hospitality that this organization has given me and for the decision of this organization to accept the Journal of Family History as one of its journals and I hope that we will not disappoint the uh, expectations that the executive committee and the organization has in us. James Walters assumed the editorship of the family coordinator. During his six years as editor, a special topical issue was published each year. The young man standing to the far right near the flowers became editor of the Journal of Marriage and the Family in 1976. This is Felix Berardo. When people ask why I became a family sociologist, I show them a picture of my family of orientation, taken several decades ago, which shows my parents and their 12 children, seven daughters and five sons. Like many early immigrants, my parents produced a large and unique cast of characters for the stage of a real-life drama that is still being played out in all of its wonderful and sometimes painful combinations and permutations. I have been both a participant and an observer of that drama for nearly half a century. It continues to fascinate me in all its unfoldings, and it has clearly influenced my continuous desire to understand marriage and family life everywhere. This photograph of NCFR's 35th president was taken when he was approximately seven years old. A native of Germany, he studied with Lank Osborne at Teachers College, Columbia University. Gerhard Neubeck, 1977 NCFR president, is a professor in family social sciences at the University of Minnesota. At NCFR, Murray Strauss of the University of New Hampshire was the recipient of the Burgess Award. Muriel Brown was the recipient of the Distinguished Service to Families Award, and Carolyn Kiefer was the recipient of the Outstanding Student Award. This child was 1977's Osborne Award recipient and has been a member of the faculty at Central Michigan University for 23 years. Evelyn Rauner, professor of the Department of Home Economics, Family Life, and Consumer Economics. Anne-Marie Williams received the Outstanding Student of the Year in 1977. She spent the following three years as a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Pennsylvania Marriage Council in the Division of Family Studies. She is currently in private practice in Philadelphia. 
In this respect, NCFR members tend to follow the divorce pattern of social scientists in the United States. They have twice as high a proportion divorced as other professional workers. Moreover, the proportion divorced for social scientists is exceeded by only a few other categories of professional workers, among whom are actors, airplane pilots, and female accountants. <laughs> Paul Glick, NCFR's 36th president. Although he is best known for his 40 years of service in the Bureau of the Census, this distinguished scholar is, today, an adjunct professor in the Department of Sociology at Arizona State University. 1978 was the year that the world's population climbed to 4.4 billion, with about 200,000 being added each day, and retirement was raised to 70 years of age. During Glick's presidency, Ethel Shanus, one of the nation's most noted gerontologists, received the Burgess Award. One of the most important events to occur during Glick's presidency was that Robert Staples, Marie Peters, and David Baptiste, on behalf of minority members within NCFR, organized a minority caucus in 1978, which became a minority section in 1981 with the revision of the Constitution. And Mary Heltzley, professor of family environment at Iowa State University, was the recipient of the Osborne Award in 1978. Rosemary Smith Nelson was the recipient that year of the Outstanding Student Award. Today, she is the co-director of the Step Family Adjustment Center in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. This young boy's work on premarital sexual standards was published in 1960, and he became one of the foremost theorists and researchers in the world in the area of sexual standards. He also became NCRFR's president in 1979. Ira L. Reese, our 37th president, professor in the Department of Sociology and the Family Studies Center at the University of Minnesota. During Reese's presidency, our journal, The Family Coordinator, was changed to Family Relations, Journal of Applied Family and Child Studies. This recipient of the Osborne Award once attended Yale University Divinity School before completing a doctorate at Teachers College, Columbia University. Mary Lou Purcell, professor and head of the Department of Family and Child Development at Auburn University. The Outstanding Student and Young Professional Award was given in 1979 to Catherine Sura, who is today an assistant professor in the Department of Human Development and Family Ecology at the University of Illinois in Urbana. This year's Burgess Award recipient is seen here sailing down the St. Lawrence River, the river on which he did so much fishing. Glenn Elder of the Department of Sociology at Cornell University in Ithaca. The only NCFR president who served as president at two affiliate levels, state and regional. Also, she served as an executive director, the first and only professional staff position for an NCFR affiliate until recently. Our 1980 president, Kate Garner, who has had more involvement in affiliates than any other president in our history. During Garner's presidency, the recipient of the Osborne Award was Gerald Leslie, professor of sociology at the University of Florida. In 1980, William Quinn was named the Outstanding Student of the Year. Today, Bill serves on the faculty in the Department of Home and Family Life at Texas Tech University. And the Distinguished Service to Families Award was presented to Wallace Fulton, who had served as NCFR president 18 years earlier. The 1980 recipient of the Burgess Award was trained in his family craft, watchmaking. He is a painter, an avid sailor, and a fleet captain of a yacht club. Charlie Brown and Lucy were on a cruise ship, and Charlie Brown went to Lucy Stan for psychiatric advice. Lucy said to Charlie Brown that some people on a cruise ship put their deck chairs on the bow of the ship and look at the sights ahead and their future docking. Some people put their deck chairs on the steering of the boat and look at sights they have passed. Charlie Brown asked Lucy, where are you on the cruise ship of life? Charlie Brown replied, Lucy, I can't even get my deck chair unfolded. <laughs> the family field has yet to unfold this deck chair 
and decide if it will go off, forward, or stand a beam with law and its endemic legal system. Here he is as a young man. His mother, born in the United States, was of an Austrian background. His father was of German-Romanian background. Marvin Sussman, Unidel Professor of Human Behavior in the College of Human Resources at the University of Delaware. Married to NCFR member Chris Jeter, Sussman is currently editor of Marriage and Family Review. Born in South Africa, this NCFR member was named an Outstanding Student of the Year in 1972. When the first issue of the Journal of Family Issues was published in 1980, he was its editor. Graham Spanier, Vice Provost for Undergraduate Studies at the State University of New York at Stony Brook. The analogy that we are asserting is that the family discipline is born. We are not arguing that it's an adult. Or that it's even in adolescence. We happen to believe that it was born some time ago, that it's at least in the toddler or preteen stage by now. But we're not asserting that as a defensible argument. We're just saying it's born. Some of our critics admit there may be a pregnancy, <laughs> but they suspect or hope there'll be a miscarriage or abortion <laughs> before it's born. Others think there are already enough siblings in the family and that the academic community ought to practice birth control. <laughs> Still others think that the idea of a family discipline is an ill-conceived notion. <laughs> With the provocative ideas that this leader has, it is little wonder that he is shown here on the front row with a bandage on his head. Wesley R. Burr, NCFR's 39th president, professor and director of the Family Living Center at Brigham Young University. Wes Burr, together with Jeffrey Lay, his collaborator, will forever be remembered for their development of phomology, a discipline that strikes terror in the hearts of traditionalists. During Burr's presidency, Evelyn Duval was the recipient of the Burgess Award. The 1981 recipient of the Osborne Award is best known for her writing and research on family decision making and in human capital development in the family. The late Beatrice Pellucci, former professor in the College of Human Ecology at Michigan State University. There were two recipients of the Outstanding Student Award in 1981. Here we see Gary Bowen, consultant to the Department of Defense and senior research associate in the SRA Corporation, Washington, D.C. And William Southerly, a member of the faculty in the Department of Sociology at Wichita State University at Wichita, Kansas. This young boy is from the Netherlands and received a doctorate in sociology from the University of Amsterdam and a doctorate in sociology from Yale University. He became editor of the Journal of Marriage and the Family in 1981. Yetzi Spray, professor of sociology at Case Western Reserve in Cleveland. He became editor of Family Relations in 1981 and reports that serving as editor has increased his golf handicap by only one stroke. Marriage and family therapist Michael Sporakowski, a professor in the Department of Family and Child Development at Virginia Tech. A prolific researcher and writer, this child became editor of the NCFR Sage Book Series in 1981. John Sconzoni, professor in the Department of Sociology and the Department of Child Development and Family Relations at the University of North Carolina at Greensboro. To honor one of our leading family theorists and researchers, the Reuben Hill Award was established and is presented annually for the article that best combines theory and methodology in the analysis and interpretation of a significant marriage or family issue. In 1981, the winners were Alan Aycock, Vern Bankston, Ira Reese, Ronald Anderson, and G.C. Sponagule. One of the early Family Life newspaper columnists, his column, Family Life Today, appeared regularly in the New York Sun and in papers throughout the East in the late 1940s, in 1980, he was named a distinguished alumnus by the Florida State University. He became the first male state family life extension specialist in the Cooperative Extension Service in the nation. NCFR's 40th president, 
James Walters, professor and head of the Department of Child and Family Development at the University of Georgia. During his presidency, a commission on the structure of NCFR, with Dennis Orthner as its chairman, was established. By 1982, volume 44 of the Journal of Marriage and the Family had grown to 1,072 pages. Volume 31 of Family Relations had grown to 592 pages, and volume 7 of the Journal of Family History had grown to 440 pages. The 1983 recipient of the Osborne Award was Gerhard Newbeck, a former NCFR president. In 1982, Joanne Patterson received the Outstanding Student Award. Today, she serves as a research associate in family social science at the University of Minnesota. A man who always hides his face when caught in the nude, NCFR's 41st president. Here he is at 11 months of age. An assertive, inquisitive, hard-working text writer, he is the best singer of all the NCFR presidents. Bert Adams, the 41st president of NCFR and professor of sociology at the University of Wisconsin at Madison. NCFR's president in 1984. Here she is, with her mouth open, a lovely, active, talkative child whose nickname in high school was Mouth. Sharon Price Bonham, Professor of Child and Family Development at the University of Georgia. As I think about retiring from the NCFR, I look back with gratitude for the gift of 27 stimulating and rewarding years of involvement and ahead with, with confidence in NCFR's future. I think with joy of knowing the very special people who constitute this membership organization and who will continue with vitality and imagination to support its growth in the years ahead. I think with appreciation of the people in the NCFR office who are concerned about NCFR's welfare, I doubt if NCFR could operate without them. And we are very fortunate that these loyal, capable, and dedicated people are a long way from retirement age. I shall always cherish the great opportunity I've had to work with this vital and responsive organization. Although I will leave NCFR with some sadness, I am convinced that its well-being is secure. Our deepest thanks to Joanne Selinski, author of A History of the National Council on Family Relations, and to her major professor, Richard Kirchhoff of Purdue University, and to Wilbur Hutchinson for his excellent tapes of NCFR leaders and to each of the leaders who contributed material to this presentation, and to each of you for your continued efforts on behalf of the National Council on Family Relations. <laughs>